All right, good morning, everybody. Thanks again for being here. Um, welcome to a little bit of a special seminar, which is being hosted now jointly by the Wilton E. Scott Institute for Energy and Innovation at Carnegie Mellon uh, and the Department of Chemical and Petroleum Engineering at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, we're joined today by Kartish Manthuram, Professor of Chemistry and Chemical Engineering at the California Institute of Technology. Kartish is I like to say West Coast educated. He has a bachelor's and doctoral degree from chemical engineering from Stanford and UC Berkeley, respectively, and spent a year as a postdoctoral researcher at Caltech before moving east, beginning his faculty career in 2017 at MIT. Uh, at MIT, he built a really fantastic research program focused on electrifying chemistry, right? Engineering catalysts, reactors to make everything from commodity chemicals to pharmaceuticals using electrochemistry, near and dear to my heart. Uh, very recently, Kartish moved back west, uh, where he took his current position now as professor at Caltech. Uh, he's received numerous awards and accolades in recognition of both his research accomplishments and his teaching. And I will add on a more personal note that I've known Kartish since very shortly after we both began our faculty careers. And um, I, I, I remark in, inwardly, I guess, at the fact that every time I ask Kartish how things are going, he always focuses not on publications or awards or on funding, but on how members of his research group are developing intellectually. And that's something that I just really admire about him. Um, so the, the, title, the title of today's talk is Electrification Decarbonization of Chemical Synthesis. I'll add that those who are participating today are welcome to type questions into the chat box during the session. Um, and I'll also solicit live questions at the end. So Professor Mantiram, take it away whenever you're ready. Awesome. Oh, wait, sorry. I have to allow you to share the screen. Oh, no, you're your co-host. You're good. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, James, for the kind of introduction and uh, for making this joint uh, seminar happen today. Just really great to see uh, so many familiar faces and, and to have this chance to uh, share with you all work that our group has been doing. So let me go ahead and share my screen. And is that coming through all right? Yep, Excellent. looks good. Perfect. All right. Um, so I, I want to start by putting up this image and just asking us to think about uh, where the carbon footprint is. And we might instinctively point to the gasoline powered vehicles or to the electricity powering the lights. Uh, but we know all too well that there's actually a carbon footprint behind virtually everything that we see here. There's a carbon footprint behind the plastic of the billboards, behind the clothing that everyone's wearing, behind the steel of the flagpole, the cement of the buildings. Uh, and even the patty of the McDonald's burger. So these carbon footprints are truly inescapable. Uh, and it's really important that we do something about decarbonizing the physical world. So we can look at this quantitatively. Uh, this plot shows the carbon footprint of the top 18 commodity chemicals uh, as a function of their production volume. And there are two major things to take away from this plot. Uh, the first is that ammonia has such a large carbon footprint that it in fact has its own y-axis. So if we were to plot everything on a single y-axis, ammonia would be up top and everything else would be compressed down at the bottom. Um, but here you can see that with a dual y-axis that ammonia still of course has the largest carbon footprint of any chemical that we make today. So if we're serious about decarbonizing chemical manufacturing, we really have to do something about ammonia. Now on top of that though, you'll still see that there are a whole range of other chemicals that individually contribute to the carbon footprint of chemical manufacturing, uh, chemicals like ethylene, methanol, propylene, BTX, and ethylene oxide. So if we're serious about achieving deep decarbonization of chemical manufacturing, then we also have to do something about all these other chemicals, um, many of which have different ways in which they generate their carbon footprint. So this is uh, a pretty complicated problem uh, to decarbonize chemical manufacturing. We'll be spending time today talking in particular about ammonia, uh, and then about making epoxides as well. So I hope this gives you some sense about of how two different chemicals could conceivably be decarbonized in their manufacturing. So if we're setting out to decarbonize chemical manufacturing, then I think it's useful to think about synthetic paradigms. And I'm showing here a few of the classical synthetic paradigms. On the far left-hand side, we have biosynthesis. So this would be the route through which nature makes a particular molecule. And so if we're trying to make ammonia, for instance, this would be the use of a nitrogenase, which would take nitrogen, water, ATP, and make those into ammonia. On the far right-hand side, we have total synthesis. This would be making a molecule from anything which is commercially available and simple. And for ammonia, uh, if we were to sort of stretch the definition of total synthesis to apply to a molecule as simple as ammonia, uh, this would mean 
the Haber-Bosch process coupled with steam methane reforming. So taking methane, water, and nitrogen and converting those to make ammonia. And so what we're interested in uh, is a synthetic paradigm in which we, instead of using anything which is commercially available, that we restrict ourselves to the use of just carbon dioxide, nitrogen, and water. So we have three molecules which provide us with four different elements with carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, and hydrogen. And we want to learn to stitch these together to make even more complex molecules. Now that's of course a pretty restrictive paradigm to go from using anything which is commercially available to just three molecules. Um, but there are ways in which things that we learn in the confines of this strict paradigm can still be used for processes that fall outside this paradigm. So one could, for instance, learn to sustainably carboxylate uh, a petroleum derived olefin, right? So there are ways that you can stretch and use lessons learned here uh, outside of this strict paradigm, but we appreciate the strictness of it just because that pushes us to innovate and do things that would otherwise uh, be thought to be too difficult. So in this paradigm, one would start with dinitrogen, reduce that to make ammonia, reduce CO2 to make CO or ethylene, uh, and then combine these first reduction products with additional steps such as oxygen atom transfer chemistry uh, to make molecules like ethylene glycol, ethylene oxide, uh, to make lactones, as well as amino acids. These are a few molecules that our group has targeted uh, over the last few years. Uh, we hold this paradigm uh, in high regard because it allows us to conduct chemical synthesis with resources that are distributed uh, and sustainable. These are ubiquitous pre pre precursors that are available virtually everywhere. Uh, and in addition, by using renewable electrons to drive synthesis, we can operate at mild conditions. And that just helps us overcome the use of temperature and pressure, uh, which while they can be sustainable, uh, prevent distributed production, production close to where chemicals are needed. And that's something that we hold um, as a goal for the future of chemical synthesis. So we'll focus in on two parts here. Uh, the first will be the synthesis of ammonia from dinitrogen. So uh, making dinitrogen an effective and sustainable source of nitrogen atoms. Uh, and then we'll talk about the use of water as an oxygen atom source. So how we could uh, take an olefin, transfer an O atom from water and make the corresponding epoxide. Uh, this could conceivably be a much more sustainable way of making uh, epoxides as building blocks in chemical synthesis. So we'll focus in first on making ammonia. So we can think first about uh, what it is that really makes ammonia production so difficult today. So this plot here shows in dollars per ton of urea, uh, the price of this nitrogen-based fertilizer in different countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, Burkina Faso, Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana, Mali, Nigeria, and Senegal, as compared to the international average. And what I think will really stand out here is that the price of fertilizers in these countries in Sub-Saharan Africa is two to three times higher than the international average. And these fertilizers cost about the same up until they're brought to port. So wherever that vessel goes in the world, um, as long as it's moving on an ocean, that costs about the same. But when it gets to port and then has to be uh, distributed inwards, that is really expensive in Sub-Saharan Africa. There just is not enough infrastructure for distributing fertilizers and the governments are unable to make the investments that are needed in infrastructure to help bring those costs down. So this has been a stubborn problem uh, over decades um, that really has not been solved despite it being realized. Those distribution costs uh, get passed on to the consumer. Um, that leads to higher fertilizer prices. Uh, sorry, that leads to lower fertilizer usage, uh, poor crop yields, uh, severe malnutrition. So there are many downstream consequences of this unsolved problem. So we can consider why it is that ammonia has to be made in a centralized fashion and then distributed. If you could just make it close to where it's needed, then you'd overcome this distribution cost issue. So today we start with methane and water, uh, do steam methane reforming to make hydrogen. This is conducted at greater than 700 degrees centigrade. And of course, since we're starting with methane, there is a stoichiometric CO2 footprint. This is why ammonia production or part of why ammonia production has the largest CO2 footprint of any chemical that we produce today. We then take that hydrogen, react with dinitrogen, making ammonia, and we do this at 400 to 500 degrees centigrade and 150 to 250 bar. And so these are pretty harsh conditions. These, uh, especially the pressure here is, is sufficiently high. That this is chemistry that you cannot easily conduct in a distributed fashion. So one needs to do this in large centralized reactors that allow for safe operation with these high temperatures and pressures, uh, but also techno-economically viable production um, which comes about through operation at larger scales. So 
we can see that the process conditions are really what dictate centralized production. And so if we were to think about what we would want in the next generation ammonia synthesis method, uh, we may strive to make that a method which operates at ambient conditions at room temperature and ambient pressure if we're being as strict as possible, uh, and one which also eliminates the CO2 footprint that would uh, be in line with our goals uh, for the sustainability of this process. So we can look at this thermodynamically, what it would take to, in essence, replace pressure with voltage. And so we can look at this reaction here, nitrogen and hydrogen being converted to ammonia. And we can consider this first from a thermochemical perspective. I have temperature here on the x-axis and pressure on the y-axis. And I've plotted here conversion. So this is a quantity which goes from zero to one. Uh, if it's zero, that means we are entirely at reactants. So we have nitrogen and hydrogen um, remaining as reactants. Whereas if the conversion is one, that means we have fully gone to products. This is an equilibrium quantity that we're plotting to make clear the thermodynamics of the process. So just based on this color map, we would prefer regions which are red. So we may look at this plot and say, well, let's operate at room temperature. But we know that there's a challenge there. It's the kinetics. And at these low temperatures, these collisions, even over the surface of a catalyst, uh, are insufficiently energetic to actually lead to meaningful conversion to ammonia. We can raise the temperature, and that certainly helps us with the kinetics, but we end up with a thermodynamic challenge that we have productive collisions, but we are now limited by equilibrium. Uh, we have essentially a zero conversion if we uh, raise the temperature to 500 degrees C. Now, the way that we recover conversion commercially is that we pressurize this reactor, and this makes sense. Uh, just from Le Chatelier's principle, uh, we see that this is a reaction in which we have a reduction in the number of moles. So pressurizing shifts the equilibrium to the right. And this is how we make all the world's ammonia today at a pressure of 200 to 250 bar. Um, and with a less than 20% single pass conversion, we take what we get. And it's really a testament to engineering that this is actually uh, a means of feeding the world with a process that has only a uh, 15 to 20% single pass conversion. Now we can replace just the y-axis of pressure here with voltage instead, uh, keeping the same x-axis of temperature. Let's say we start at 500 degrees centigrade and we now apply a voltage instead to recover conversion. And you'll see here with a third of a volt by thermodynamics, one can uh, shift this equilibrium from left to right making ammonia with essentially a unit conversion. So I think it's really important to emphasize how different these plots are. When we apply pressure, we follow equilibrium contours. And so applying more and more pressure, we stay still in a region which is similarly blue and we're fighting these curved contours. In contrast with voltage, we cut across equilibrium contours. And that's uh, really something that's special. Voltage allows us to take linear excursions through free energy space. And it's something you just can't do with pressure. And so um, we can see here why voltage is such a special driving force uh, when it comes to the thermodynamics of a chemical reaction. Now there's something that isn't captured in this plot, which is that voltage also helps the kinetics. So one could conceivably operate at lower temperatures as well. So you may look at these plots and say, well, should we do every chemical reaction electrochemically? Um, despite being an electrochemist, I, I actually think uh, that uh, we, we should not do every reaction electrochemically. Uh, there are some reactions that are better driven with temperature and pressure. And so uh, we've tried to lay out a thermodynamic theory that helps uh, give suggestions as to whether uh, a given process should be run with voltage or temperature or pressure. Of course, there are much more, uh, many more detailed technical economic considerations that ultimately determine that. But one can tell a lot just from the thermodynamics of a reaction as to uh, which driving force uh, is most appropriate. So the previous slide may give you the impression that this should already be possible electrochemically and, and that this is the way that the world should be conducting this reaction uh, today. But it turns out that catalysts for doing this reaction are really underdeveloped. And so here we are using lithium metal uh, as a catalyst to drive nitrogen dissociation. So we're leaning on lithium to do what is probably the most difficult step of this reaction, breaking this inert and strong nitrogen triple bond. I still remember joining um, the lab that I did as a graduate student and being told uh, in the first few weeks that I should never place lithium metal in a nitrogen filled glove box. Uh, it turns out here that that is what really does the trick. Um, so one ends up making lithium nitride, 
Uh, that lithium nitride then can be protolyzed, so it, we can react with a proton donor in solution, which will leave generic for the moment. That in turn leads to exchange of the lithium ions with protons, making ammonia, uh, discharge of a lithium ion in, into solution, which can then be plated to make lithium metal. So one can then continue uh, around this cycle. So there are in fact manifestations of this process. Um, there is work going all the way back to the 1930s by, by Erlenmeyer of Erlenmeyer flask fame, uh, showing that lithium metal reacts with nitrogen. So there's uh, you know, essentially nearly a century long history uh, of, of doing this as a method of uh, dissociating nitrogen gas. Um, there are two more recent manifestations that I want to share here that have really uh, established sort of the modern protocol by which one uh, conducts this sort of chemistry. So one can, for instance, start with a lithium chloride, lithium hydroxide bath. Uh, this is a molten uh, mixture at 400 to 500 degrees centigrade, uh, played out lithium metal, uh, scrape that off, uh, put it into a beaker, introduce dinitrogen, uh, then hydrolyze that such that one produces ammonia, uh, boil off the ammonia and water, leaving behind lithium hydroxide, and then melt that lithium hydroxide again. So this is a uh, batch-wise process by which one can see that this uh, chemistry does in fact work. One can get an 80% Faraday efficiency uh, for making ammonia. Now, perhaps one of the limitations here though is that it's a batch-wise chemistry and uh, there is a demonstration from the, 19, from the 1990s showing that one can actually do this as a one-pot reaction as well. That you can have a copper electrode immersion solution, a platinum electrode immersed in that same solution, uh, lithium perchlorate and THF with ethanol, and that by bubbling nitrogen through and plating lithium out, one can actually do this in a continuous fashion at a steady state, uh, constant potential. Um, there's a hit in the Faraday efficiency. So uh, only uh, 8% uh, here for making ammonia. So uh, the Faraday efficiency is defined as the fraction of electrons that go toward making the desired product. So with a Faraday efficiency of 10%, for instance, that would mean that one in 10 electrons are going toward making ammonia, while the rest go toward undesired products. Here, hydrogen. You'll see also that the rates are pretty mod modest, uh, 0.55 nanomoles per centimeter squared per second. So there's a lot of room for improvement here when it came to this uh, one pot process for converting nitrogen into ammonia at ambient conditions. So we set out then to, uh, with this goal, practical goal of wanting to improve rates and efficiencies, uh, but that we really wanted to do this through understanding mechanism. We wanted to understand the coupled transport kinetics uh, that exist in this system. So I'm showing here the sort of cell design that we developed. Uh, this is a parallel plate reactor uh, inspired by similar cell designs uh, that have been used for CO2 reduction. Uh, and so we have a copper cathode on the left side, a platinum anode on the right side, a ceramic separator, which is uh, commonly used in lead acid batteries. So this is a, poly a polyporous uh, polyethylene based separator. Uh, one has then this plating of uh, lithium metal from this lithium tetrafluoroborate electrolyte. Uh, we've substituted lithium perchlorate for tetrafluoroborate for safety reasons. So this, uh, we're just feeling a little more comfortable with this chemistry. Um, this is done in THF. Uh, with ethanol as the as the proton donor. And so all these steps uh, that are needed ultimately to make ammonia are occurring simultaneously on the electrode surface. We're plating lithium ions to make lithium metal. That lithium metal reacts with dinitrogen, which comes to the surface and dissociates. That then gets protonated, making ammonia, and that comes off the surface. And one can operate then uh, galvanostatically uh, at several milliamps per centimeter squared and higher, as I'll show later. Uh, we've also confirmed that these yields do, in fact, come from dinitrogen. Um, there's a, a whole slew of papers out there that uh, apparently generate their ammonia from nitrate and nitrite and from other impurities that are present. So it's really important to do the isotope-based uh, confirmation. Uh, here we see quantitative agreement of the ammonia yields, uh, irrespective of whether we use N15 or N14 and using NMR uh, to see that the yields do, in fact, arise from the labeled uh, nitrogen. So with a reproducible method and one which is confirmed with isotope labeling, we set out to understand the kinetics of this process. Uh, and I'll show here just a few samples of that kinetic data to help uh, give some idea of how we conduct these kinetic analyses. So first, for instance, measuring the order dependence uh, for ammonia synthesis for the partial current as a function of the partial pressure of nitrogen. 
Uh, and you'll see here an approximate first order dependence, which is unsurprising given how we expect nitrogen to be a reactant in this chemistry. Uh, then measuring the partial current for ammonia as a function of the overall current here. And we see an unusual one and a half order dependence. So there's a non-integer order that arises here. Uh, and there's also a plateau, which I'll come back uh, and mention um, the origin of in just a moment. And we can also measure the, the log of the partial current for ammonia as a function of the log of the concentration of ethanol. And you'll see here that this follows a Goldilocks paradigm. Uh, that if you have too little ethanol, uh, you don't make much ammonia. If you have too much ethanol, you also don't make ammonia. There's a sweet spot in the middle. Um, this makes sense just from the perspective that if there's too much ethanol, we would have uncontrolled hydrogen evolution. And if there's too little ethanol, then we don't have the proton donor that we ultimately need to protonate the lithium nitride to make ammonia. So we can develop a really simple model that helps to account for many of these different features. Uh, first, this plating of lithium ions to make lithium metal. That lithium metal then going down one of two branches. The productive branch is reaction with nitrogen to generate lithium nitride. And that lithium nitride could then react with proton donor to make ammonia. But that lithium metal is not guaranteed that it'll react with dinitrogen. It could just as easily react with proton donor in solution, which in turn would generate hydrogen as a product. And this is the side reaction that we're fighting. So if lithium metal can be intercepted by dinitrogen first, we will get to our desired product. But if it doesn't, we end up with a side product. So we really need to figure out how to facilitate uh, nitridation. We can write out really simple rate laws for these reactions. And this really, for me, connects back to you know, things that we learn even in undergraduate kinetics. So uh, you'll see this model is, is actually pretty simple. Uh, the rate of hydrogen evolution which is this branch up here, is some rate constant K1 times lithium uh, right here, raised to some power alpha, which we keep arbitrary for the time being. And that lithium is reacting with ethanol, so we have that raised to some arbitrary power X. The rate of ammonia synthesis, so the product here, is some rate constant K2 times lithium raised to some power beta times nitrogen. And we already know that its order dependence is one, from here, so we've went ahead and enforced that. We can take these two very simple rate laws, apply a steady state approximation for the concentration of lithium on the surface of the electrode, uh, and putting those together, we end up with this expression for the partial current for ammonia. This also uh, relies on the fact that we have a relatively small ammonia yield, which helps to simplify the, the denominator just by comparing terms. But you'll see a few very simple uh, features arise from this model. The first is that even if alpha, x, and beta are integers, as we would accept, expect for a simple kinetic model, the order dependence of partial current on current, as well as on ethanol, can exhibit a non-integer order. So uh, integer values of beta and alpha interacting here can make non-integer orders as we see. In addition to that, you'll find that current and ethanol have equal but opposite order dependencies as long as x equals one, which is reasonable uh, based on the model that we've assigned here. And you'll see here on the left-hand side that the order dependence on current and the order dependence on ethanol have equal but opposite order dependencies. So positive three halves here and negative three halves here. And so this very simple kinetic model is able to capture uh, this equal but opposite order dependence. Now that's just the kinetic portion of the model. And I want to make the argument now that there are, in fact, transport limitations as well, which will really be important for the rest uh, of what I'll share here on ammonia synthesis. So if you look very carefully at this plot, you'll see this plateau on the right-hand side. And this plateau is really the telltale sign of there being a nitrogen transport limitation, that even as we push more and more current in the system, plating more and more lithium metal, there is a physical limit to how much nitrogen can be fixed. Uh, and that's because of the transport of nitrogen to the surface. So uh, if we look at the solubility of nitrogen, it's known diffusivity, we measure the boundary layer thickness, we can see uh, with a great deal of confidence that this uh, limit here is in fact due to nitrogen transport. We can also tell just by adding in a stir bar and stirring faster that the rate goes up. So that gives us a very clear confirmation that, that this is in fact a transport limitation. So that means that this model needs a second part. A kinetic portion is insufficient. So we need to add in a transport correction. And you'll see here 
uh, variables like delta, the boundary layer thickness, D, the diffusivity. Um, so we're accounting for transport characteristics. And together, these two parts are able to quantitatively predict uh, partial currents for ammonia across a wide range of operating conditions. Now, when we started this chemistry, the, the record Faraday efficiency uh, prior to that was 8.5%, as reported by Sinetto et al. in the 90s. We tried to empirically optimize this chemistry over a period of several months, uh, thinking that we could surely uh, 30 or 25 years later find a better operating condition. Um, it turns out those efforts were not productive. Uh, when we developed the model uh, and predicted a single data point coming out of that, uh, we were actually able to double the Faraday efficiency in a single experiment. So uh, we were able to get up to just under 20%. So now one in five electrons approximately going to the right place. The rate here is about 10 nanomoles per centimeter squared per second. And the issue here is that that is just about at the transport limited rate. That's the highest rate that we can achieve. And even if we were to make better interfacial catalysts and processes for somehow fixing nitrogen faster, that would be entirely masked by transport in this system. So it is really important that we find a way of overcoming that transport limitation to break that limit of 10 nanomoles per centimeter squared per second. And that's a number that we'll come back to shortly. So we can recap very briefly here what the problems are. Uh, the first challenge here uh, is simply that we need to get dinitrogen uh, from the electrolyte to the surface of the copper cathode. The second problem is that while we're really excited to be making ammonia, we are doing that while chewing up both THF and ethanol. So if I were to claim that this is a sustainable way of making ammonia, you should definitely push back because this is clearly chewing up molecules that cost even more to make something cheaper. So yeah, there's sustainability issues, there are techno-economic issues, there are a lot of problems with this uh, sort of manifestation. So we need to solve both of these issues. And we put forth that if we were to use gas diffusion electrodes at both the cathode and anode, that these challenges could be overcome. The gas diffusion electrode would provide efficient contacting of the gas phase nitrogen with the liquid phase electrolyte. Um, and the solid phase support here, which is bringing in the electrons that are needed for the reduction. Um, the same thing could be implemented at the anode as well, a gas diffusion electrode, which allows for contacting of hydrogen, which we introduce, and that by oxidizing hydrogen, we could overcome the oxidation of THF and ethanol, that really hydrogen should be uh, our proton source here. And so this would then enable this overall reaction of nitrogen and hydrogen going to ammonia, as long as the hydrogen comes from a sustainable place. So we can try to implement a conventional gas diffusion electrode. So I show here one uh, which is based on carbon fibers. Uh, this carbon fiber support has catalysts deposited on it. And with an aqueous electrolyte, this works rather well. A carbon fiber based electrode uh, does not wick up an aqueous electrolyte. And so it, it is not simply flooded. Uh, this creates a nice clean boundary where one is able to contact the gas with the liquid electrolyte and with the solid catalysts that are here. There's also PTFE waterproofing, which helps uh, even further in tuning the extent of aqueous electrolyte infiltration. And one can really tune that wetting uh, to get this boundary to fall at the right place. Now, if we take that same carbon fiber-based electrode and we try to use it in our system, this non-aqueous electrolyte based on THF, it is entirely flooded. And that's what we found uh, in our early studies, that THF loves to wet carbon fibers. It, in fact, even likes to wet PTFE. It is not repelled by PTFE. You can take a block of PTFE and put a drop of THF on it, and it will not beat up on it, which was honestly and intuitively what I had thought would be the case uh, prior, to, prior to that point. So one can uh, see here that there is a, a challenge in, in wetting, and uh, the way to overcome this is to use a different material um, that is porous. And so we've exchanged now a carbon fiber-based support for one that is based on stainless steel. The stainless steel cloth uh, is not as easily wet by the non-aqueous electrolyte as our carbon fibers. So this leads um, to a degree of prevention of flooding uh, of this steel, stainless steel cloth support. We also apply a very small pressure uh, across this stainless steel cloth uh, which allows us to maintain this boundary, as I'll show in a moment. So the stainless steel cloth can be used directly as the cathode. We're just plating lithium metal out on it, so that can be put right into the cell. 
And at the anode, we need to deposit platinum as a catalyst for oxidizing hydrogen. Of course, there may be uh, cheaper alternatives, but here we wanted to uh, start with something that was simple. Uh, platinum does not adhere well uh, to stainless steel clods. So one needs to first deposit nickel and then deposit platinum on top of that. And so the nickel strike provides adhesion of platinum, which is helpful here. So we can see how this works. Uh, the rate of ammonia synthesis on the y-axis as a function of current density. And you'll see here that before we had a limitation from transport of 10 nanomoles per centimeter squared per second, so that would have fallen right here. And with the gas diffusion electrode, we can go several times above that, getting as high as about 30 nanomoles per centimeter squared per second. And in addition, the Faraday coefficients also benefit. So we can get to a point where about 40 to 50% of the electrons are going towards making ammonia uh, with a modest pressure gradient. Uh, there's actually a large window here of robustness. So irrespective of whether you're at a half a kilopascal or one and a half kilopascals, um, you actually get a very similar and stable performance uh, when it comes to the ammonia synthesis Faraday efficiency. So now nearly half of the electrons uh, are going where we want them to. So it's important to see uh, what happens on the other side of the cell as well, uh, what happens when it comes to the hydrogen oxidation. So here on the left-hand side, we have the potential on the x-axis that we're applying. So here going to the right, uh, we're applying more and more oxidizing potentials. And we have current density on the y-axis. You'll see at first that the current increases as we're oxidizing hydrogen. But eventually in a flooded system, we have a transport limitation. So the current plateaus out. And then as we go to higher over potentials, we start to oxidize THF. And so uh, this is of course um, exactly what we want to prevent. And we can look now at what happens when we implement the stainless steel cloth electrode. And so this is, we're comparing the stainless steel cloth electrode shown in black uh, to platinum on carbon fibers shown in red and green and blue. And with these electro electrodes, uh, the conventional electrodes, we see that especially at high current densities, uh, we do not have robust performance. But with the stainless steel cloth, for the reasons that I shared earlier, uh, we're able to maintain a high hydrogen oxidation Faraday efficiency across a wide range of current densities, uh, suppressing the THF oxidation uh, that would otherwise occur. So we want to see what happens uh, if we couple this uh, to water splitting. It's not enough just to take hydrogen uh, from a gas cylinder, uh, which would, of course, come from steam methane reforming. So we want to see that we can couple this to a water electrolyzer. And so in here, we are coupling the system that we've developed, the electrochemical Haber-Bosch reactor, with an electrochemical water splitting device. Uh, and we find uh, with this sort of prototype arrangement that one can maintain the Faraday efficiencies um, it's just important to have a THF bubbler in between these two steps um, that in effect is doing two things. It's trapping whatever water is in, in, in the vapor phase such that that doesn't enter the second cell. It's also helping to saturate the electrolyte with THF uh, so that one doesn't just end up stripping this electrolyte um, over time. So it helps with stability. So um, there, of course, are a lot more things uh, to be done to effectively integrate these two systems. Um, and there are a lot of synergies that can be realized when one looks at this from a process perspective. So I think it's useful just to step back for a moment and compare this um, to systems that are reported uh, in the literature. And so I'm showing here in green, in red, orange, uh, and blue, uh, points that are from literature reports of ammonia synthesis catalysts. On the x-axis, we have Faraday efficiency, and on the y-axis, we have production rate. Uh, and you'll see that this lithium-mediated system that we've uh, pushed forward uh, is one which has rates that are one to two orders of magnitude higher than what's been observed before. Uh, but there's, of course, room to improve the Faraday efficiency. So we're um, clearly excited to see a system performing better than it has before. But I want to emphasize uh, that there are a lot of issues here that remain. And perhaps the biggest is energy efficiency. Uh, the system, as, as we've uh, conducted so far, has an energy efficiency of about 2%. Uh, most of the energy goes towards moving ions through the electrolyte. We've really focused in on the interfacial reactions, on making those more uh, selective from an electron count perspective and in increasing the rates. Uh, but we have not focused on designing better electrolytes for the system when it comes to a conductivity perspective. So uh, about 70% of the energy that one puts in goes towards uh, just moving ions in the electrolyte. 
So that's a really big opportunity for making the system more effective. One also needs to develop new proton donors, and this is something that we've looked at uh, in collaboration with uh, Venkat Viswanathan's group at CMU, um, considering how one can classify proton donors uh, based on their camelot TAF parameters, and that helps to give uh, some insights into how one could design uh, better proton donors in the future. So I want to shift gears here just to tell you a little bit about oxygen atom transfer chemistry uh, and how one can use water as a sustainable source of oxygen atoms to make diverse products uh, that contain O atom functionality. So we'll look at epoxidation specifically. Um, I want to highlight a few of the challenges that exist today in making epoxides. And so first here, we can look at thermochemical approaches, starting, for instance, with ethylene, reacting with oxygen, 270 to 290 degrees centigrade, 20 bar of pressure. One would do this over a silver catalyst supported on alumina uh, and make ethylene oxide. If that was all that was happening and, and these were the process conditions and this was the only product, I wouldn't really have any qualms with this. I, I really do think these are pretty benign uh, conditions. Um, however, for every six or so uh, approximately ethylenes that become ethylene oxide, one ethylene is over oxidized and makes CO2. And this is why in part the production of ethylene oxide has the fifth largest CO2 footprint of any chemical that we produce today. So it's really important that we find ways of uh, devising new processes that overcome the CO2 footprint. So one can look at alternative processes uh, like the chlorohydrin process shown here, reacting an olefin like propylene with hypochlorous acid, 30 to 50 centigrade, two to three bar, even more benign conditions. One makes a chlorohydrin. A chlorohydrin can be treated with base with stoichiometric calcium hydroxide, making the epoxide and a stoichiometric calcium chloride side product. So this looks better from a CO2 footprint perspective. You don't really generate much uh, in terms of overoxidation, uh, benign process conditions, but the stoichiometric side product is a significant enough environmental issue in terms of discharge of the brine water that approvals for, the, for this process and permitting of this process is actually becoming more challenging. And we're actually seeing a decline of commercial implementation of the chlorohydrin process. That in turn is leading uh, to implementation and commercialization of uh, peroxide-based processes, which are, which are really becoming the standard now. So one could, for instance, start with an olefin, treat with metachloroperbenzoic acid, transferring just this one O atom uh, to the olefin, making the corresponding epoxide, but you make a stoichiometric byproduct. You make this corresponding carboxylic acid. There are, of course, more sustainable ways of doing this. You can use just hydrogen peroxide instead. Uh, but my friends who are process chemists tell me that these are very frightening reactions at scale. There are accidents that happen every year. Um, there are fatalities that happen uh, every few years due to peroxide-based chemistry. So it is really important that we find uh, safer, more sustainable, uh, and environmentally friendly methods of making epoxides. There really isn't a method that, uh, that comes without, comp without significant compromise uh, today. So when we were starting to work in this chemistry um, and, and we were sketching on a whiteboard, uh, th this was the reaction that we first sketched out, uh, that of an olefin plus water going to an epoxide plus hydrogen. Uh, we knew that there uh, was not literature precedence for it, but we thought that water uh, could be a really attractive O atom source. Um, of course, this mixture of an olefin and water is inert. There really are not significant safety hazards uh, associated with the reagents uh, that we bring into this chemistry. So if we were to do this electrochemically to help shift this equilibrium to the right, since of course, from a thermochemical perspective, this is really unfavorable. Uh, one at the anode of this reactor would want to activate water, generating reactive O atoms, which can transfer to the olefin while liberating protons, which go across the cell and electrons, which pass through the external circuit. The protons and electrons would converge at the cathode, generating hydrogen. So the argument that I really want to make here is that this is a glorified form of water splitting. We're taking water, we're breaking it down, we're making hydrogen, and instead of making O2, which we really complain about how difficult it is, and then we just vent it and give it up to the universe, uh, why not take those O atoms and place them on an olefin instead? Um, this could perhaps be done with even a smaller energy footprint. So water splitting requires 1.23 volts. Uh, the thermodynamic energy, uh, thermodynamic potential that's required 
uh, for this reaction is 0.8 volts. So one could conceivably reduce the energy footprint as well. Uh, of course, only if uh, suitable catalysts are developed. And we're, we're still uh, far from achieving a process which is more energy efficient than water splitting, uh, but at least um, that prospect is there if we continue to make progress on this chemistry. So we reasoned uh, that manganese oxide could perhaps be an attractive catalyst for this reaction. Um, it is relatively poor at water oxidation, uh, but we liked that because that would help to suppress O atom, O atom recombination. So we could suppress O2 evolution, uh, but it can still activate water. And that's something that's been shown uh, in a series of prior studies in the literature that it can in fact activate water. So we thought that manganese oxide could be a good catalyst for this reaction. So we uh, make uh, manganese oxide nanoparticles um, uh, from this sort of uh, synthesis protocol, starting with manganese 3-acetate and myristic acid, uh, heating up to 295 degrees centigrade, injecting decanol, making myristate cap manganese oxide, uh, stripping off the ligands, depositing, depositing that on carbon paper, and annealing such that we end up with MN304 uh, as our final form uh, for the manganese oxide. So here, uh, first, we are looking at a model reaction, that of cyclooctene, uh, and that is a nice substrate to use because there are a lot of literature reports that we can compare to. We're using platinum foil uh, as the cathode, so there we haven't uh, really invested significant efforts uh, in finding cheaper or alternative catalysts. We're doing this in a one compartment cell. The electrolyte is five molar water with 0.1 molar TBABF4 and acetonitrile. So we need a mixed electrolyte since the water is the O atom source. But if we were to use water alone, the cyclooctane wouldn't be soluble. So you need a mixed electrolyte with acetonitrile and water. And we find that the Faraday efficiency for epoxide as we go to more oxidizing potentials, that we could actually get up to about a third of the electrons to go to the right place. So we were uh, pretty excited to see that this reaction was in fact uh, possible over manganese oxide. At the cathode, uh, we're making hydrogen pretty selectively. Uh, so about 100% Faraday efficiency average over time. Uh, and that, of course, is an unoptimized uh, electrode on the other side of this reactor. We spent a lot of time trying to understand the mechanism of this reaction. And, uh, and this slide really doesn't do justice to it, but I wanted to give just a very short summary of what we've uh, looked at. Uh, we, we find uh, that there is a one electron transfer in the rate limiting step just based on measurement of the Toffel slope. The reaction is first order in water and cyclooctane. Um, there's no observed hydrogen deuterium kinetic isotope effect, which gives us uh, some understanding that this is not a coupled proton electron transfer in the rate determining step. Uh, the CV indicates that manganese 4 is the resting state. And we experimentally observe an equilibrium between olefin and epoxide. This is probably one of the more surprising uh, kinetic realizations. And so that's led us to propose that O atom transfer occurs in a pre-equilibrium step based especially on this final observation, um, that the rate limiting step is manganese 2 uh, associating with water in a one electron oxidation, that this is rate limiting, that it does not involve um, a proton transfer just since we do not see a hydrogen deuterium kinetic isotope effect, uh, and then remaining steps which we postulate just to help close the cycle. But this is really um, for us, the hypothesized mechanism that we're continuing to test uh, through in-situ X-ray absorption spectroscopy experiments to better understand uh, the resting state of the catalyst uh, and more detailed kinetic studies as well. So this isn't just about uh, epoxidation chemistry, um, which of course is an electrophilic oxygen atom transfer. Um, we're also looking at nucleophilic oxygen atom transfers, uh, such as lactonization. And so one can even take uh, a cyclic ketone of the sort shown here. And if one has an appropriate catalyst like platinum, uh, which can make nucleophilic oxygens, uh, one can in fact get to a cyclic uh, ketone, of, uh, sorry, a cyclic lactone of the sort that we're showing here. So uh, it is in fact possible to even do O atom insertion into a carbon-carbon bond, uh, which is much more challenging chemistry. Uh, and there's still a lot of room uh, to improve Faradayic efficiencies in those sorts of reactions. Uh, but we're seeing that one can use water to introduce uh, different types of oxygen atoms, whether that's an epoxide, a lactone, uh, or even O atom insertion into a CH bond. So I've talked both about ammonia synthesis uh, and about using water as an O atom source. Um, I'll just very briefly mention that there's another third of our group that works on CO2 chemistry. Um, I don't have time here uh, today to share that chemistry, but uh, we spent a lot of time looking um, at metal thalocyanines and porphyrins as catalysts for CO2 reduction. 
uh, finding that a lot of uh, results out in the literature are in fact transport limited. Uh, and so the intrinsic activity of these catalysts are actually a lot uh, higher than has been previously realized. We're also uh, have developed uh, Bayesian statistics methods uh, for kinetic parameter analysis. I think it's uh, re really cool to be able to use all the data that we collect uh, and to develop models that give us uh, confidence intervals, uh, even in electrocatalysis, where I think statistics are used uh, a little less frequently than, than, than they could be. Um, and I'll mention uh, just finally uh, that in addition to doing CO2 reduction, um, it's, it's neat to think about how we can use CO2 as a carboxylation source. So one can extend carbon chains going from C2s to C3s or C3s to C4s. Uh, and carboxylation, I think, is a great way to be able to do that. Um, there are, of course, other approaches like hydroformylation uh, that one could also electrify, uh, which we're working on as well. Uh, but there's just great richness of these sort of carboxylation chemistries at the surface, uh, a lot of competing side reactions um, that one needs to learn to suppress, uh, but that one can through introducing specific salts that help to suppress specific nucleophilic side reactions that exist otherwise. Uh, but this is another area in which I think um, there's a lot of room for innovation. Uh, so with that, I really, I really like to thank the students and postdocs uh, who've, who've done all the hard work uh, on these projects, uh, especially Nick Lazowski and Kyung Suk Jin, who started the efforts on ammonia synthesis uh, and on O atom transfer when we were uh, just starting as a research group in 2017. Um, and I'd like to thank all of you for spending this time uh, listening to our work today, and I'd be very, very happy to take any questions that you have. Thank you so much, Kartish. All right. Um... If anybody wants to do a virtual round of applause, I'm going to click my button. There we go. I'm going to second right away that comment you made about statistics and electrochemical catalysis. And, you know, members of my group can attest to how much I harp on that. Yeah, a lot, a lot um, of room for error bars uh, and just for knowing how well we know something. So, yeah, yeah. completely. Um, okay, so I'm going to open the floor for questions. Um, Participants are welcome to either use the raise hand function um, and I will invite you to unmute or you can pop a question into the chat. We'll try to focus on student questions uh, first. Okay, well, I have one right away that I'll maybe help get some juices flowing. Um, can you comment a little bit, Kartish, on uh, like upper bound energy efficiency estimates that might be achievable if you could overcome most of the limitations in the lithium mediated ammonia synthesis. My, my main thinking here is that I don't have a great calibration about what the respective thermodynamic like equilibrium potentials for the lithium reaction and the ammonia synthesis reactions are under the sort of non-aqueous conditions in which you're running this system. Definitely, yeah, this is, this is a fantastic question. So uh, if one looks at the energy that's needed to make lithium metal, which is which is which is not insignificant, right? That's that's a pretty uh, a very reducing metal. Um, one will find that the theoretical energy efficiency of this process, if it genuinely has to go through lithium metal, uh, would be about thirty percent. And so that that is a ceiling uh, for this method. Uh, one can look at the techno-economics, even even knowing that thirty percent could be the ceiling, uh, and we find that at about a twenty percent uh, energy efficiency. Uh, along with a current of uh, over 100 milliamps per centimeter squared um, and further improvements in rates uh, that one could in fact get this to a place where it's technically economically viable, but it relies really on having cheap electricity. So, um, and so if, if solar and wind continue to go in the direction that they are, and if they actually uh, follow some of the forecasts that have been put out there, um, then it is conceivable that this could be a method which is useful, especially in stranded environments. Um, but from there, I think it really is important that we think about how do we take shortcuts through the free energy landscape, right? right? Do we, we don't really uh, genuinely need to go through lithium metal as an intermediate. So can we somehow get around that? And that's something that our group uh, is thinking about and working on, but I think it's a really difficult problem. So it's it's possible that we won't achieve that, uh, but it's, it's something that I think is worth trying to do nonetheless. Other questions? Evan has one. Go ahead and unmute Evan. Hi, Professor. Thank you very much for a great presentation. Um, question about the lithium mediated nitrogen reduction. Um, so lithium is like pretty hot material in terms of energy storage, a um, lot of technical applications. In terms of scaling and deploying um, this sort of new reduction capability that you have, are you looking at 
lithium as the only mediator or are you looking at other materials as well uh, to be able to really use this at scale? Yeah, really, really important point that you bring up, Evan. So um, if, if we think about other metals in the periodic table and we've, we've um, really uh, looked uh, across the periodic table to understand um, what it is that makes lithium special. So one could look, for instance, at uh, potassium or cesium or, or things which are uh, even more electropositive, right? Things that we would expect to be uh, perhaps even more reducing. And so um, it turns out that the nitride that would form from those uh, is not thermodynamically stable. Um, so it, does, it doesn't form spontaneously. Um, and that's in part because lithium nitride uh, we, we view it as a very ionic solid, but it apparently also has a not insignificant covalent stabilization. So there's uh, some degree of covalency between the lithium and nitrogen that remain and similarity in the radiuses as well, right? That help benefit uh, that structure that forms. And so uh, that's lost as we go uh, to cations that have larger and larger radii. That's one factor. Um, the other is that there are other metals that can make nitrites, but that just are not uh, don't happen very easily at ambient conditions. So uh, there are other transition metals, for instance, that can that can make a nitride, uh, but to get it to be kinetically fast, one has to go to elevated uh, temperatures. And so um, there's some trade-offs there that exist. Um, of course, there I think there may be ways through which one can push through those, but lithium so far has remained uh, for us uh, the simplest um, sort of mediator to use in this chemistry. Got it, thank you very much. We have a question in the chat from Haital Liu. Um, could you comment on the prospect of nitrogen oxidation to nitric acid and added that they think that that's, that would be a downhill reaction? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So we, um, I, I know a few years ago, we spent a little bit of time working on uh, working on this. I think others in the, in the field have made much more progress really than, than, than we have. Uh, and I would say that uh, plasma-based methods really seem to be uh, uh, pretty good at this uh, compared to electrochemical methods. So this might be a, a place with, where, where um, those of you who are experts on plasma-based chemistry could really, I think, have a lot of impact. But there, there are a lot of groups out there that I think are doing uh, uh, very innovative work in that space, and even that's translating to uh, possible startups that they've created. Other questions? I have an opportunity to talk to Dr. Manthiram later, and so I have a functionally infinite list that I'm happy to fill in, but would also hold them close to the chest if there are others. Hi. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> I, I, there's someone else who raised the hand before me. So. Oh, that's okay. Um, the other one. That, that's just fine. You can go first. Oh, okay. So, um, hi, I'm, my name is Ana Torres. I'm new faculty at Carnegie Mellon and PSC. So uh, I, I've been working a lot with um, renewable electricity and how to couple it with, with chem chemical processes. And many, most of the renewable electricity that we can have um, is, is of an intermittent um, source, you know, that so it will be it would be ideal if we can couple with processes that can turn on and off very easily. And I would like your, your perspective on that. Uh, so will these processes be, um, be working, you know, with, with intermittent power sources or do they need, a, you know, to be run on a very steady base of electricity? I yeah, don't know if, can yeah. you, <laughs> it is clear the question because like I'm on the process side, so not, on, not that much on the chemistry and that, those are the problems that we are facing. On how to couple, you know, okay. all things. Okay. Yeah, the point you brought up is just, um, in, in my view, like uh, the, this point of intermittency is what the technical economics of, of so many different chemicals hinges on, right? If, if, if one can develop processes that are robust to intermittency or that somehow get around it, uh, then the path to technical economic vi viability opens up. So I think your, 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 your point's really well taken. So in the ammonia synthesis case, and, and we worked on a pretty detailed techno-economic study that we're wrapping up right now, um, we find that there are actually a few ways that you can overcome intermittency. Um, and that's by storing energy um, in an unconventional ways. So when we started this effort, we thought, well, I guess we have to store it like in a lithium ion battery or in some other large grid scale storage device or a redox flow battery or something sort. And we were kind of pricing that out. Uh, and then we realized that you could actually store energy by making hydrogen. I and mean, we need to split water. And so split the water when, when, when the sun shines or the wind blows, 
and then store that hydrogen transiently over the course of a day or so. Uh, same with doing the separations of, of air to make nitrogen. Um, you can store those things. And so there's, there's actually chemical ways of storing intermediates. Um, and then you can save those for when you then uh, can actually conduct the chemistry even further. So there are ways of overcoming intermittency and storing some of that energy to conduct chemistry even when it's dark. And so that's something that um, we've been really um, excited to see that you can iron out some of the variability in the process. Now, we still find uh, that you benefit from having small amounts of energy storage. So even though uh, you know lithium-ion batteries for grid storage may, may still be on the expensive end, implementing some amount of that is still helpful. And of course, if there are other energy storage technologies that are that are um, that are competitive at scale, um, those could be priced in as well. Uh, but it's a much smaller amount than we thought would be needed uh, uh, to implement, just since the chemicals themselves provide some degree of storage along the way. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna stick with the uh, uh, as many questions from students as we can. Uh, so we have one in the chat from Chinmay um, asking. Uh, you, uh, 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 the question is, can you tell uh, how to handle, tell us how to handle alkene miscibility uh, in water and the oxygen transfer chemistry that you described? Yeah, solubility is a, is a real challenge. Um, and, and this is uh, just because of necessity, why we've been forced to use blended electrolytes. So we've, uh, you know, we, we started using water at first and we found solubility was really poor. Uh, then we've switched to these blended electrolytes with the nitrile and water. Uh, those help uh, with, with alkene solubility. Um, there are other ways to get around this too, which is that if your reaction is occurring just at the interface, that's when solubility is really a problem. And you can overcome this in part by using a mediator. So we've, we've also published some chemistry last year um, showing that if you generate, for instance, chlorine at the electrolyte, and have that go into solution, uh, make hypochlorous acid, react with the olefin in solution, by distributing that charge if effectively through a mediator throughout the electrolyte, you can now react even with a pretty low concentration of alkene throughout the electrolyte. So um, you can actually overcome uh, what would be rate limitations arising from transport by using a mediator instead. So um, there are a few ways of getting around this, either by tuning the electrolyte composition or using a mediator both of which can allow you to uh, handle low mis what would otherwise be low uh, reaction rates. Another one in the chat, how did you choose your separator for ammonia synthesis? Um, and asking a second kind of follow up about maybe how the separator or your choice would impact uh, crossover and side products and so on. Yeah, so the, the ceramic separator is one uh, which is uh, thicker than, than conventional uh, polyporous separators. So we started with ones like CellGuard that are, that are used in lithium ion batteries. We found there was still some crossover of ammonia. And if some of that ammonia got across, it could be oxidized uh, at the anode. So we, we uh, went with this thicker separator, which helped to stop some of that crossover. Uh, and it's of course just stable since it's um, uh, based on uh, polyolefins. Um, but uh, crossover is definitely a challenge. And if one can develop uh, electrolytes uh, or po polymeric electrolytes, uh, which are more conductive um, and help prevent uh, any of this sort of crossover, uh, then this chemistry will, will head in a more practical direction. All right. I think we have time just for one more. Professor Vaser, go ahead when you're ready. Thanks, James. Uh, yeah, wonderful talk. And, and I have a question it's sort of related to, to Anna's question, sort of big picture question, taking a step back and uh, looking at electrochemistry in, in the chemical industry. I mean, we have, of course, had a couple of electrochemical processes that have been running forever, but electrochemistry really hasn't made much inroads. And I'm wondering from your perspective right now, obviously we see really a recurrence of interest in electrochemistry right now. What, what really is the main holdup? Is it energy or faradaic efficiency? Is it the cost of electricity or the intermittency like Anna was referring to? Is it the lack of available process technologies for these? Or is it, I mean, like James and I often talk about really the fact that engineers just don't get electrochemistry, are not trained in electrochemistry, and that's why we really don't think about it even when we go into, into industrial uh, application. Yeah, I think uh, it, there's a great connection here in terms of like what uh, we do in research and how that connects to education and how sometimes just knowing about something can, can change its viability and, and the knowledge can, can, can change what that looks like. And so when I, when I look broadly, I think uh, many of the factors that you brought up uh, are, are important contributors here. Uh, intermittency definitely is one of 
uh, the bigger techno-economic uh, barriers. Uh, on top of that, electrochemical um, architectures and hardware remain pretty expensive, but we know that uh, as they continue to be produced at larger scales and in larger numbers, um, the, the cost of those hardware, of, of the hardware, the flow plates, um, the electrodes, et cetera, uh, will only benefit. I think Nathion's a great example of this, uh, of something that because we now produce it at relatively large scales, like its cost has come down. But if anytime a new ionomer is developed, it does not have that benefit of scale. And so, um, and, and uh, you know, that, that's apparent certainly for other electrochemical technologies that we see how they move down the learning curve, but uh, it's clearly a barrier when something is new and just starting. Um, in terms of education, I, I, I definitely agree that um, when I talk to folks um, at, at large chemical companies, um, uh, that expertise in electrochemistry isn't, isn't always there, and that does create some degree of reluctance. Um, but they honestly have good reasons, too. They, they, it's not that they haven't tried. They have tried to implement certain electrochemical processes over the last 20 years. Uh, and in many cases, those pilots have failed. And so they're, they're informed by those experiences as well. Um, but we know that the techno-economic landscape is shifting with just dropping electricity prices, uh, our sustainability goals, uh, and those are certainly creating um, new motivation to try again on some of those processes and to try again in new ways. Um, and so it's, uh, it's definitely uh, you know, a complicated situation because some of these things have been tried for 150 years, right? The, the origin of electrochemistry and organic synthesis are very much tied together. Uh, and it happened that the world went in a thermochemical direction for good reasons at that time. Uh, we just know a lot more than we did then uh, about how to control reactions. Um, and, uh, and, and hopefully those tools lead to this being a productive wave for this chemistry. Kartish, would you go so far as to say there's never been a better time to learn electrochemistry? I think so. I, I think that's a fair conclusion. <laughs> All right, we can take that one to the bank. Yes. <laughs> All right, with that, uh, thank you all again so much. Um, and we will uh, uh, see you again here sometime soon. Thanks a lot. Thank you. See ya. Sure.